Today we're talking about, are you a child of God? Now, probably many of you will probably be like, well, yeah, the Bible says so. I'm a child of God. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I'm a child of God. Did you know there's actually something in the Bible that tells you, if you can, how to tell if you're a child of God? That's pretty cool, right? Something you can actually have to, to tell for sure if you are a child of God. So that's what we're going to get into today. How can you tell? What does the Bible say to it? I'm going to go the long way there, though, because I'm building a foundation. All right? In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it's my favorite, truthfully, it's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, these three verses. However, um, so I could just quote it, but I want to have it in front of me because I want to give you time to get there. Oops, and it's right after Galatians here. You know, in this day and age, it's gotten awfully easy to just, you know, scroll there on a phone, and we, we get bad at finding stuff in the Bible. So that, we're going to get a little workout here so we can start getting back into our Bibles. If you didn't bring one today, bring one, because this is good food. Whoops. All right, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay. Now, last week, Pastor Mark spoke about grace. And he did an awesome job, didn't he? <laughs> did any of you have that kind of moment where you're like, just realizing again how much God loves you? So we see that right in the beginning here. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we see it's grace that saves us. All right, so everything I say from beyond here, I am building on a foundation that it is grace that saves you. So if for any moment during this sermon, or when uh, Eric preaches next week, and he's going to be building on another aspect of this that I'm not going to hit today, if at any time during these two sermons, you think that we're saying that you're saved by works, just realize you're wrong. <laughs> you're hearing me wrong. You're hearing us wrong because that is not our intention. We are going to show you some aspects of this, okay? But it does not diminish the fact that we are saved by grace. The work was done by Jesus on the cross, and nothing we can do can overrule that, okay? So can we all agree? We're saved by grace. Are we good? Amen. Okay. but I want to show you something about the end of this verse where it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. The Greek word that is translated as workmanship is the word poema. This word means a, a work, a created thing. It, it has the, uh, an artistic bent to it. It's where we get our word poem from, Okay. So this poema is something that is created, but it is usually something that is artistic. Now, um, you know, so if you're like, a, CJ's a poet. So, you know, poema can be, mean a beautiful poem to him. You are God's poem created in Christ Jesus for good works, okay? If you're a musician like me, you can say, you are God's song. It would be appropriate. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Um, do we have any people who knit here? Anybody who knits? No? Oh, crochet? Okay. Close enough. We'll go with that. Okay? You are God's tapestry. Knitted together in Christ Jesus for good works. How about any car guys? Car guys? 
Uh, would I get more if I said truck guys? <laughs> no, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. They're like, yeah, truck. You know, okay. You need to get your son here. He'd be like, yeah. You know, forget the car. Um, okay. You are God's Lamborghini. Put together and built together in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? Are you, are you getting the picture here? Something I could say for my wife and I actually right now is we are God's baked Alaska. Have you, do you know what that is? I didn't until, you know, when, whenever Leslie and I go on a diet together, we watch cooking shows. Has anybody ever, ever done that? You go on a diet and watch cooking shows to watch all that good food. It's like, if I, if I can't eat it, I'm at least going to drool over it, okay? Baked Alaska is like ice cream that has other stuff on top of it, and they light it on fire. And you had me at ice cream, but then, you know, you're grilling it too, like you put fire to it, like, praise God, this is heaven. You know, I have, I have yet to find a place that makes it, like, I... I don't know of any place around here. I've got to find some place. If, if you ever go in a place and you see baked Alaska on the menu, tell me. I want to try it. It just looks phenomenal, okay? But you are God's baked Alaska. Savory, good, cooked ice cream in Christ Jesus for good works because you're so yummy, you know? <laughs> but what do all these things have in common? All these beautiful works of art, they all have a creator, right? Somebody had to create them. And what we need to understand is when we come to Jesus, when he becomes Lord and Savior of our life, that's just new birth. When we are saved, that is new birth. Every parent here knows that <laughs> the, the work only begins when you have the baby, right? Now, women, do not throw anything at me. But in comparison to the 18 or nowadays 20, 25 years of work that goes into raising a child, the birth is a small part, right? It's the easy part in comparison. Right? Nobody's throwing anything yet. That's good. It's, there is a whole lot of growth that has to happen after the birth. And when we come to Jesus, it is new birth, okay? We are born, but we are babes in Christ. We need to grow in him. So what does this have to do with us being children of God? Hold your horses. I'm getting there, okay? We're not there yet. In Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, that's in the Old Testament. If you find, if you're in the Old Testament and you see anything but Malachi, you need to turn right. Go this way. If you're in the New Testament, you need to turn left because it is the last book of the Old Testament. All right, so Malachi chapter 3. Now, again, those who have Growing up in church, immediately when you hear Malachi chapter 3, you're thinking, oh, he's going to preach on tithes. No, there's actually more in that chapter than tithes. It's a good one for tithes, but that is not what I'm talking about today. Malachi chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 2 and 3. It says, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that he may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see, when we look at how God raises us up, all right, after we are born into him. There is this picture of a fire with God throughout Scripture. But realize what he is talking to us who have come into his kingdom, he is not coming as an incinerator. That is not his purpose. His purpose is not in judgment to destroy you. 
His purpose is as a refiner's fire to test you in the flame so that the dross comes up, the, the junk, the sin in our lives comes up. And as that comes up, it, what a refiner does is they will heat up these, these metals, okay, like uh, you know, gold or silver and all that stuff. They, they will heat it till it melts, and you'll you see it glowing hot. You might have seen pictures of this before uh, or videos of this, and all the impurities come to the top. And so they can scoop them off the top. They become apparent. What you couldn't see before, now under the fire, it comes to the surface. And the refiner isn't sitting there going, oh, you dirty gold. <laughs> no, he's like, oh, good, this stuff comes up. I can scoop it out. I, know, I, I think some of us have this picture of God as he's always standing over us with a, a bat ready to hit us. I know I used to. And it, we, we laugh, but truthfully, that is, that is something that is so destructive in coming to God because he is not putting you through the fire for the purpose of beating you down. He's putting you through the fire to make those impurities come to the surface so he can scrape them off. He's testing you so that you can become more like him. It is not to destroy you. It is to build you up, to help you grow, for you to mature. God has a purpose. You are his workmanship, his poem, his song, his Lamborghini, his baked Alaska. Oh, gosh, I'm hungry. Beth has a soup cooking at the house. It's, I'm probably going to talk a lot about food today. But, <laughs> but you're his workmanship. He is putting you through the fire to make you better. And when I start talking like this, don't think it's, okay, just because I know the, the, the image that puts in some people's heads. You start to get this like, oh, he's one of them, like, holier than thou. It has nothing to do with holier than now. It has everything to do with holier than I was. It's not for me to compare myself to anybody else except for who I was and say, praise God, I'm not that man anymore. So one of the things as we are put through the fires we go through tests in our life. And as we're in the word, because the word is integral to this, you can go through tests and not have the word in you and get nothing from it. But when, you have the, when you're in the word and when you're getting good preaching, that's when you say, yeah, yeah, good preaching, yeah. One person, okay, I like you. You're welcome. <laughs> as you get that and you go through the fire, you now have something that brings those impurities to the top. All right? The word is absolutely necessary. And as those things come to the surface, here's, here's, the, there, here's the place where it breaks off from the, that image, from that refiner's fire image, because you see... In the natural, it is not the gold that scoops out the impurities. It's that creator, right? It's the, the, the person who is running the, the, uh, the refinery. <laughs> Thank you. But in this, in our spiritual lives, God does not do that without our partnering with him. we have to decide to allow ourselves to be scooped for the impurities to be taken. You know, um, when I came to Jesus at 25, you know, I grew up in church. I, my mother was a pastor. I was around it all my life. I had, by the time, age of 15, I had been more Bible studies than probably most people have been through in their lives because I had a mother that trained me up in the way that I should go. Now, I ran from that from 15 to 25. I ran hard. And one of the things I ran to was drugs. 
drugs and alcohol became a major part of my life. And when I started to see how much it was destroying my life, I would quit. Like I'd quit alcohol, but then I'd do more drugs. Or I'd say, oh, the drugs are getting out of control. I'm going to stop that, but then I'd drink more. I, I wasn't really doing anything better. I was just switching what, what my crutch was for that week. But when I came to Jesus, when I gave my life over to him, for me, alcohol was just gone. It was, for me, alcohol was easy. It was just gone. Weed, not so much. That was a struggle for me. And I, after I was saved, I was still smoking pot. And actually, at the time, I didn't see a problem with it. So I was like, hey, I'm changing all this stuff in my life. I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, besides breaking the law. But besides that, right, you know, <laughs> minor. Um, but I came, <laughs> we had this prophet come to speak. And he prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for people. And it, it, dur- during this, it was like a week-long service. And, you know, I had been smoking weed for a decade. All right? So I knew what I could do. I would come home from work. This was me going to revival services for the week. I'd come home from work. I'd smoke a couple bowls of pot, get pretty high. But by the time the service came around, I was mellowed back out. I was good. And I'd go enjoy, have myself a hallelujah Jesus time. Everything was good, right? Until midweek, I do my normal routine, and I was completely, I was sober, I was good by the time I got to the church. I stepped into the doors of the sanctuary, and suddenly I was so high I could barely stand. And a paranoia came over me. I felt like I had stoned written across my forehead, and everybody could see it. I was so scared. You know, the the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I had some fear of the Lord that night. Okay, and now don't make a theology about what I'm about to say, okay? But I'm just ex- telling you how this worked for me on that particular night. Though I was struggling with all this paranoia, this baptism of the Holy Spirit he was talking about, it, it intrigued me. So I went up for prayer. And only, the only way I can explain it is this. You know, this was a time when the, the, the church was big on pushing people, and uh, I was a person, I'd fight it, yeah. And I still am. I don't, I don't like that. If I, I want something real. I don't want, I don't want somebody, you know, playing a game with me. But that night, I didn't let them push me down. But I knelt down after and and just wept because I felt I missed something. And I just bawled my eyes out because I, I, I had this extreme feeling of loss. I didn't even know what it was, but I just knew I had missed it. And between the fear that I had and that feeling of loss, I'm like, there is no way I'm going to let something stand in the way of me getting what God has for me. The very next morning, I drove to where I had my stash of pot and on my way to work, I threw it out the window. That on my paraphernalia, gone. And that night when I went back to the service, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, don't make a theology out of an experience. But that is what happened for me, okay? It was awesome. And I was on cloud nine without being high. <laughs> I didn't feel like I needed it. But you know what happened a couple weeks later? I had, I had been, before I came to Christ, I had been living with this girl. And so after I got saved, I moved back in with my parents for a little bit to get back on my feet and get out of that situation. I'm walking through my parents' house, which, you know, my mother's a former pastor. Um, you know, so you figure, you know, nice Christian home. And as I'm walking through the living room, I just happened to look down, and there is the biggest, fattest bud I've ever seen 
laying there in the middle of the floor. It's like, wow. That never happened when I used to do drugs. Only when you're trying to get sober, right? Does that happen that it's just like, here's free weed in the middle of the floor. And I picked it up. And I realized I was, there was this choice in front of me right now. I realized there was, though I thought it all ended that night, there was still a desire within me. And I had this choice to make. Was I going to partner with God? Now, I didn't understand all this at the time. I just knew I had a choice. I look back now and I realize I was either going to partner with God with this refining process he was putting me through, or I was going to go back and keep wallowing in the same mud. And so I took that, I went to the bathroom. After a big breath, I dropped it in the toilet and flushed it. And I've never struggled with that since. It's not to say I have not ever been tempted, but I've never struggled. There is a difference. I'll talk about that another day. But realize temptation is not the sin. Sin is what you do with the temptation. And some of you, I think, needed to hear that today to free you up from thinking, if I get tempted, then I'm already done. No, the temptation is the test coming saying, what are you going to do with me? Okay. But how does this pertain to me being a child of God? I'm getting there. Hold on. I'm almost there. It's a little bit further. In John, John chapter 15, okay, this is the, out of the first, the first four chapters in the New Testament are the Gospels. The last one is the book of John, all right? If you're looking at it, it says 1st John, 2nd or 3rd or John, wrong John, just John, John the Gospel, John chapter 9, and you will not find a chapter 9 in any of those other Johns, all right? Only, or sorry, not 9, look... I'm looking at this where I turn to, not where I'm going. 15. You won't find that either. John chapter 15. There. Takes me a minute. You know when you have your own Bible and it just turns to where you want to go? This this preaching Bible hasn't got there yet. Okay, we're working on it. Get it put in line. All right. There's, oh, there's so much good teaching in John chapter 15. I'm only going to just touch it, okay? John chapter 15, verse 2 says, and this is Jesus speaking, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, that he is his father. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. All right. Realize Jesus is talking to people in an agrarian culture here, so this is something that makes immediate sense to them. Now, pruning is, as a a plant grows, you will trim off those little spurious branches to make sure it will grow more fruit. Um, You know, and today, a a better example that you can understand might be of, like, weeding. Has anybody had to weed a garden or anything like that before? That's terrible, isn't it? (laughs) My, My parents always had a big garden, and they wanted us kids to go out and weed. It was, it was punishment, okay? That's what I felt like. It was punishment. Did not like it. But this is why I like to talk and, and share this part like it's weeding, because I think it makes, it'll make easier sense to us. Because, you know, when you put fertilizer on a garden, it makes your plants grow better, Right? It also makes the weeds grow better, doesn't it? It makes everything grow better. It's not dis- discriminatory. And when God comes into your life and you begin to step out in things, you know what? It's not just the good things that come up. When you start walking in God, everything grows. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Let me show you this in the Bible, okay? Because I, I don't want you to think I'm just coming up with this out of nowhere. Um, I'm just going to tell you the story because you're going to be familiar with it. Um, 
there's a time when Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. He's coming towards his crucifixion. So his, his face is set on Jerusalem. He needs to get there. He needs to not be uh, sidetracked by other things. And so he comes by the Samaritan village, okay? And the Bible uh, says the Samaritans would not receive him because his face was set on Jerusalem, okay? So the reason why they didn't receive him was because in, in God's foreknowledge, he was saying, this is not a time for that. It is time for him to accomplish his main mission, okay? But James and John, okay, they've been in, with Jesus now three years. They've been getting a lot of fertilizer. They have gone out themselves commissioned by Jesus and preached the good news, seen people healed, seen demons cast out. They've seen all this crazy stuff happen. So they are, they're walking on cloud nine. They have faith, right? And so they see the Samaritans do not receive Jesus. Now they do not perceive the reasoning, at least not yet. And so James and John go to Jesus They say, Master, tell us to call down fire like Ezekiel and we'll burn up that whole village. It's like, it's like like if somebody didn't like my sermon and somebody else from the church came up and said, Pastor, tell me to call the fire down from God and burn them up because they didn't like your sermon. You know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't rebuke them because the faith they were walking in was good. I mean, what type of meetings are you having that you think, hey, if my, if my teacher tells me I can call down fire, it can happen. That's some good meetings, right? However, what was not good was their heart. Jesus says, you do not understand what spirit you are of. Because I didn't come to condemn man, but that through, the, through me they might be saved. You know, and he's like, trimming. That's that pruning. That's that weeding. You see, everything came up. With that building of faith, you also saw the attitudes grow, right? The not necessarily great attitudes. But in the context of this community that he had, he weeded them. He said, yeah, let's, your faith is good. Your attitude, not so much. Let's take that out. Let's trim that up. Let's pull that out. You can read through the Gospels and see places where Jesus do this, does this. He, he takes something that, where they're stepping out in faith but there's something wrong with the way they're doing it. And he just says, no, no, no. Faith is good, but that, not so much. Just get that picture of he's snip. He's just snipping stuff off. And that's how Jesus works with us. As that stuff comes up, he's snipping off those things that are not godlike. You know, before Jesus... Uh, was raised, I was raised in a Christian home, but I went through a, a large portion from, I don't remember how old I was at the time. It was probably 11 or 12, the first time it happened. My daughter, uh, my daughter, my father, I don't know where daughter came from. My father <laughs> uh, had, would leave my mother for a time and, and go with these other women. And for a time in my life, I was going with him to these places, and that was what I saw. And so I began to go down that road myself of having sex outside of marriage and just stepping into these things and living in a way that God has not called us to live. And then a little while later, as I did this, I also was molested. And so I got all this stuff going on. When I came to Jesus, I got married pretty soon afterwards. And I want to tell you something, people. 
for those of you that are not married or newly married, if you're struggling in those areas, marriage doesn't fix it. It may seem to for a time, but it does not fix it. You still need to deal with your heart. You still need to deal with that dross. You need to scoop it off. You need to snip it. You need to deal with that because how it's going to come up later is you're going to go through a time. You know, the honeymoon does end eventually, okay? And you're going to go through a time when you're going to, men, not feel like you are getting all your owed. Let's just put it like that, okay? Okay? And this world we are in right now, it is way too easy to see images of women that will feed a certain part of a, a man's sexuality. So how it happened with me was when my mother-in-law died, I had a real crisis of faith for a while. And I started looking at images that weren't good, and that grew. And I encourage you, if you are here today and that's a struggle of yours, take care of this as soon as possible. Do not let it grow. Because part of me getting control of this in my life so that I was victorious over it was, one, having to sit down with my wife and son and admit what I had been doing. That is the hardest conversation I've ever had in my life. And then I had sat down with my pastor and said, I need help. And he walked me through a time of accountability and showing me in the scriptures what it said, how I could be free. And it took time and it took effort and it was not easy. But I could tell you today, I am victorious in Christ over porn. And you can be too. And it doesn't, if that's not your struggle, I don't care. Whatever it is, God can make you victorious. He is bigger than your mountain. Amen? Amen. But I will say this I'm just going to touch on this because I believe everything we struggle with, there's three parts to it there's the spiritual. That's what Jesus takes care of. We need to bring it to him. There's the soul part of it, the emotion, the will, the, uh, the mind, the emotion, and will. That takes healing. And then there's the practical, where sometimes, depending on what it is, you just need to be smart about what you're doing. That's where the discipline comes in. And you need all three. To this day, I am careful what I watch, because I don't want to entice myself to something that is not my wife. We are a whole man. We need to deal with the whole thing, not just a part. Okay. But how does this pertain to being a child of God? I'm getting there now. Okay? I'm finally there. Finally there. (laughs) In Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. This is towards the end of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 12. This is going to be a longer one, but you're going to see how this all ties together now. It says, For consider him, talking about Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted, sorry, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure, now listen, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? 
But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay. So I'm going to give you, has anybody ever read the Amplified Bible before? where like, it explains out certain words and stuff. I'm going to give you my version of the Amplified. Very simple, to one verse in there, where it says, if you endure chastening or correction, God deals with you as sons or daughters. Okay? If we want God to deal with us as his children, we need to listen. This process that it talks about, it's saying, hey, join in the process so I can deal with you as sons and daughters. I'm going to bring this to a close here in just a second. Because, see, sometimes we get this idea that coming to Jesus is just getting a get-out-of-jail-free card. Amen. Uh, you know, he did all the work for me. So I just, I say the prayer. I, I raise the hand, say the prayer, get my card, and I'm good to go. <laughs> when we come to Jesus, it's not about getting a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's about making him Lord of your life. It is exchanging your old life for something new. He has done the work, but you step into something new or you're never really receiving it, are you? You see, it's about trading in your old life where you are the God of your own universe and taking up the new creation life where Jesus is Lord of your life. <laughs> Recently, uh, probably a couple months ago, I had somebody ask me, do you ever get angry? And I laughed. And in fact, I went to Pastor Mitch. If you watch Dueling Pastors or if you used to be here before when he was the pastor here, you know him. And he, you know, he of course, knows me because he was my pastor for uh, eight years. And I told him what that person had said, and he laughed too. He didn't stop laughing, though. I'm like, okay. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> but he knew me in my anger. You see, uh, I, like many men, had a temper. And my temper, most of the time, came out when I was at home. Not because I wanted to hurt those at home, but because I'm trying my best to control it. And you know what? Just trying to, by discipline, controlling your anger, it, <laughs> that doesn't work. Because you're not dealing with the whole man, right? You're just doing the physical. And how that would come out, because I, didn't, I never hurt my, my family or you know, laid a hand on them. But if I got really angry, I would break something. Because it was better doing that than it was hurting somebody I loved. And you know what? Oftentimes, I had a good reason for it. You know, it's not that I was just like flying off the handle for no reason. You know, I, whether it was, you know, growing up, whether it was family problems or, you know, seeing things in the church where my mother was a pastor, seeing my father run off and do his thing and seeing the church turn against my mother who was not doing anything wrong at that time. I was angry. Run-ins, you know, I had, crazy thing is, I, 
when I was younger, and actually any time I've had a run-in with police, I've had times when I've had run-ins with the police where I've been accused of things that I never did. Multiple times that's happened. Now, there are things I did in my past that I deserved it, okay? Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but whatever they actually got me for when I was a kid and teenager and stuff, it was never stuff that I did. It made me angry. The molestation, times that I was cheated on, stuff made me angry. I had a right to be angry. But here's the thing. When I made Jesus Lord of my life, I gave up that right. You know why? Because he had a right once that he gave up. When he was on that cross, looking at people that he was dying for, he was there to save them from their sins, and yet they put him on the cross and were killing him. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, when we come into the kingdom of God, we give up some rights. We make him Lord of our life. And he begins to work with his creationship, uh, creation, with his workmanship, with his poema, his tapestry, his poem, his song, his Lamborghini, his baked Alaska. It's his prerogative to set the rules. And he's calling us to grow in him, saying, come on, partner with this process. Allow me to prune. Allow me to scoop the dross off. Take that stuff that when you read in your Bible and you're like, ooh, it's, you know, it's like a mirror and it shows you all the... It, actually, this is what the Bible is like. Men, have you ever gone into your, your, after your wife's been in the bathroom and she has that mirror there and you look at it like, oh, I can see yourself with this. But why does she need this? Because there's a mirror right here. I don't understand. And then you flip it around and it's like a hundred times magnification. You can see every pore in your face. You know that thing I'm talking about? That's the Bible. Because prior to, you know, coming into God's kingdom and prior to getting into his word, you have that like far out mirror view and you're like, I look pretty good. Everything's nice here. Look at this beautiful skin. And then the Bible turns up that hundred times magnification. You're seeing like all the imperfections. You're like, oh gosh, I need to do something like that. You know, get, get me some of that, uh, you know, astringent or whatever the stuff is. I don't know. But <laughs> we need to allow the Bible to have its work in us. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to just work in you. you know, and this is a time, sometimes there are times when I ask everybody to come up and we're going to have people to pray with you. Uh, we want to have more altar times like that. But today, I think it's a different time. What I'd like to do today is I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, is there something in your life that he is magnifying right now? Is there something that he wants to bring to the surface, something he wants to trim off? And realize this is nothing for shame or condemnation. This is God saying, hey, this is the process. Join with me. It's something we are, in that Hebrews, it says something we are all partakers in. Maybe you're not going something, through something at the moment, but we all have it. If we are sons and daughters of God, we will all have it. So there is no shame because we're all in the same boat, okay? But I'm going to pray. If the, if the Lord shows you something, I would ask you just to raise your hand. Just as, you know, It makes me feel good to know that God is doing something. But it also is a step of faith for you acknowledging, yes, I hear the Lord speaking to my heart on something. And then we're going to I'm going to pray that you know, God will give us the strength to work through that, 
And then we're going to sing that song again, that new song. We're going to declare that because we need to start getting this foundation of realize who God has made us and the authority he has given us and that we no longer have to let these mountains be bigger than God. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for each and every one here. I pray in the name of Jesus that by your Holy Spirit right now you'd speak to our hearts. Speak to each and every one, Lord God. If there is something you want to work in us right now, Lord Jesus, if there's something that you want to bring to the surface so you can scoop off, would you speak to us now and and show us, Lord God? If you feel the Lord has shown you something, could you raise your hand? And I'm, I'm raising my hand not to show you how to do it. God showed me something I didn't even realize. And he's speaking to my heart too. Amen. Lord God, I pray for each and every one here that you would show us how to partner with you that you would give us strength, that by your spirit you would cut off any ties with the enemy that is empowering this and that you would give us the strength to step into victory. And Lord God, as we we go over the process of being coming free over the next couple months, Lord Jesus, help us to learn and to grow and to gain gain true victory in you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus and all God's church said, amen. All right, let's... uh, Let's finish with this song here, because you know what? I don't like preaching on something like this and then ending on a somber note, because in Jesus, we have victory, amen? We don't need to sit here all somber, and you know that used to be the way the church back in the day of like, we don't get happy, we don't get joyful. You know what? The Bible says, in him there is fullness of joy. So uh, we don't have to do that. So let's... uh, Let's stand, join with me, and we're going to sing this song. Ooh, there we go. All right, I got to grab myself a drink first. That was a lot of talking. <laughs> Yes.
my God is greater than death. Hell and the grave. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. And so I speak. that this week you will draw us close to you. Help us to remember the things that you're working on us. Draw us closer. Teach us how to step into this victory. And Lord God, we pray that you shut the mouth of the enemy that when we would fall would tell us that we cannot do better. Because in you there is victory. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Good to see you all, church. We'll see you next week.